Well, to finish some of our narrative <clears throat> from chapter 12, we saw David's fasting. We saw the very immediate spiritual effort that he had after he had backslidden in such a horrible way, which if you have not experienced, that is a very humbling thing to do, to go and to step right back in to relationship and service to your God, knowing it's very much the prodigal son image. I will go back and I will be a servant to my father, and the father receives him as his son. And uh, a very, very humbling, but a very sweet experience. And David knew very well, and he believed God when God told him, you know, the Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. And he went and he, he fasted and he prayed, and when the child died, he received the will of God, and he accepted the will of God. And he did not take root as bitterness in him and anger and, and such things, but something that we very much need to learn to do. Because if you find yourself discontent and complaining through life, you're not in acceptance of what God has permitted in your life. Remember that when they went through the desert, they murmured and they murmured and they complained and they murmured because they were not willing to accept the prescription that God has given for them for their life. And we've got to be careful because we'll be right in the middle of it and we don't even realize that we're discontent and that we're grumblers and we're complainers and that we're you know, not accepting of what God has given unto us to experience and to do. But... <clears throat> he got up and uh, and he anointed himself and he ate and he confused his servants to no end. And verse 24 in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, sorry, I don't know if I said that, but we're 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. Then David, comfort, David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now, wouldn't we love to know all the details, right? Now, how does that work? And did Bathsheba ever know? And did David take that to his grave? And I don't know, but you want to talk about emotional baggage if he did. And, you know, and, you know, and some people read this just with disgust. Well, what do you expect him to do? Well, think for, as a widow and not take care? I don't know, you know? But we find ourselves very quickly with a lot of criticism for the situation. But nevertheless, you know, he took care of her. He was kind to her. And um, she bore a son and called him Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Wow. Out of such an ugly situation, right, the Lord loved him. If you, For some of us, you can stop and think, maybe we came out of ugly situations, or maybe we came out of two ugly people that didn't know the Lord, that didn't know anything about sanctification. <laughs> and you're like, well, why should the Lord love that one? You know, well, the Lord loved him. You know, and you, you think about the, all the ways, there's no such thing as an illegitimate child. You know, that's a horrible term we have. Oh, they're an illegitimate child. No, there's, there's such a thing as illegitimate parents, but there's no such thing as an illegitimate child. Right? And that, you know, that God loves that little one. And Solomon was born, and uh, he was born under the conditions of a lot of drama. It could qualify as a full-blown soap opera, but, but the Lord loved him. And the Lord did not hold uh, the sins of others against him. And, and he sent a message by Nathan, the prophet, and so he called his name Jedidiah, because the Lord loved him. Um, because of the Lord. And so that's interesting. I don't, probably not many of us know that you know, Solomon actually had two names. You know, there was Solomon, and then there was his nickname from the Lord, Jedidiah, you know, loved of the Lord. And so this is what was going on in, in the meantime. Verse 26, Now Joab fought against uh, Rabab of the Ammonites, and he took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabab. Moreover, I have taken the 
city of waters. Now then, gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest the city and it be called by my name. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabban, fought against it, and took it. And he took the crown for their king from his head, and the weight of the I'm sorry, see the weight of it was a talent of gold, and it was pre, it was a precious stone, and it was placed on David's head. And that's shocking, isn't it? Some of us like know that firsthand that while you were being busy being bad, God was busy being good to you still. And that's that's pretty shocking. Because we expect God to be like us. You know, in the moment that something bad was bad, we, we just seem like we can't expect anything good. But that's the amazing thing, that so often while we're busy being bad, God is still busy being good. And while we break our promises, God keeps His. And, and, and He does all those things. And I think it's amazing that all this was going on with David and God was still blessing him in that sense and in that capacity. Now, David had consequences. Please don't think he didn't. But here, and I, and I wondered, what was it like for David? And did he go and did he stand there with that crown placed on his head? And was he plagued with the conviction? Why have you continued to be so kind to me, God, to give me this success? I can think of times when I was backslidden and I led somebody to Christ. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if, if you could have driven a dagger of conviction deeper. And I thought, God, that's not right or fair or even appropriate. You know, to take, but, but the, you know, that's the thing is that our being bad doesn't keep God from being good. Our being bad does remove us from His will, which does have its consequences. And it, and it also sets, in, 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 in the course of events, it, it rolls a domino of consequences sometimes that cannot be stopped, and it's going to go. But you know, the, the, the thing is, I think sometimes we think that, oh, if we're bad, God's going to be you know, bad in a sense, and you know, if we're good, God's going to be good. And we, and we have this perverted perspective of what... God being our Father is. As if our relationship with God was nothing more than, than obedience or a lack of obedience and bad consequence. As if it was summed up in Hebrews that every son whom he receiveth, you know, he scourgeth. There's so much more. That e even the most basic rudimentary parent you know, sees the disobedience of their child, they, they address it, and at the same time, there's attention towards that child. There's provision for that child through the whole thing. There's care, there's protection, nourishing. There's seeing to the, the, all their transportation, and they, you know, take them there, and they do this with them, and they go to school, and, they, and, they, and that's the way God is with us to, to such a great extent. In that while we have our ups and downs, boy, He just stays the same, doesn't he? And thank God that he does. And he brought out the spoil of the city, uh, a very great amount, and, it, and he brought it out to the people who were in it and set them to labor with saws and iron picks and iron axes, and he made them toil at the brick kilns, and thus he did to all the cities of the Ammonites. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Now Absalom... Chapter 13, Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, and the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. He was a sly rascal, you know, in other words. And he said to him, uh, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came 
to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare for food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, where he was lying down, and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked cakes and baked cakes, and she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Send out everyone from me. So everyone went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the chamber, that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister." She answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. As for me, where could I carry my shame? As for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her, and being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. <clears throat> for anybody who has lived their life with a a good enough mentality uh, you know this this teaching may not hit home for you and you know what i mean oh good enough that's that's good enough and we we do good enough all kinds of ways we do good enough physically don't we you know, I see people go to the gym and they're like, oh, let's work out. No, nah, that's good enough. You know, <laughs> that's good enough. Well, you know, is it producing the results that you set out to get to obtain? Well, no, not yet. Well, it's not good enough, right? Then it's not achieving what you wanted it to do. I, I recall in, you know, tutoring and, and when I was in doing my undergrad at Tarleton State and and I would study with people and. I recall them saying, oh, that's, that's good enough. That's good enough. And we'd go, we'd take the text test the next day, they'd make a 60. And we're like, well, your good enough was not good enough, was it? You know? and, but, but the worst thing that we can do, and this is the way that the Lord Jesus Christ described the church of Laodicea as a good enough church. Right? Oh, you're neither warm nor hot. Oh, it's, it's warm enough. You know? We're cool enough to be to enjoy the world. We're warm enough to be religious. You know, we're rich. We got everything we need. He said, you're wretched, blind, and naked. Don't even know it. Good enough. Because the people who are good enough spiritually fall into an ignorant rut of life wherewith they have an appearance of being religious, yet they never, ever walk down the road that God had ordained for them from the foundation of the earth. Laodicea said we're good enough. And then they even described themselves as being, you know, well off and rich and prosperous and we have everything we need and we don't lack anything. And, 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 and as far as they knew, it was, it was all good enough. But what they did not realize is that they were so far off the path that God had chosen and ordained for them. You know, that that they miss something, and, and that's the trouble with a good enough spiritual mentality, is that we never end up walking the route that God had chosen for us. How early did the Israelites want to go back to Israel? And they did not want to continue that little adventure that God had set before them. You know, when they got up close to the promised land, who was it? It was, uh, what were the two tribes that that looked around and they said, you know, uh, half the tribe of Manasseh, it was Reuben Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh, who were the, the tribe? Yeah. And, you know, they, they got up close to the promised land and they said, you know, this is, this is good enough. I know that God called us to go over there, but this is good enough to be here. And they never really fully went to the place where God had chosen them to be. And at some point in time in a Christian's life, and and this is evidenced in Scripture. This is evidenced in our lives around us that, you know, people start off their walk with the Lord and at some point in time they say, it's good enough. And they stop. And they don't continue 
down that road and they find some means, and it's typically in the, in the affluency, you know, that, that people do this. We don't find Christians doing this so much under persecution and hardship, but in affluency, it happens to us, just like Laodicea, right? They were wealthy. You know, we're rich. You know, we got all that we, all that we need. That it was, you know, it was good enough to them, but uh, good enough is a very much a relative term. I, I drove here from Alvarado this morning, and I crossed, I don't know how many bridges, I bet 40 or 50 bridges, I would imagine easily. And you know, all of them were good enough. They were. And you're like, by what, why, by what metric do you determine that, Jeff? Well, I, I drove across them with a semi next to me, and I, I made it across. You know, they didn't break. They haven't broken for you know, 40, 50 years, however long, and, and they're not breaking. They're, they're good enough. But, but in, in that example, there is a creator and a purpose of that bridge by which good enough was determined. If you, if you follow me, hold on, you know, that there was a team of engineers that sat down and they purposed, hey, this bridge is determined to carry, you know, three lanes of traffic eastbound on I-20. And it needs to carry this much. And by a creator and by a determined purpose, good enough was determined and good enough was delivered. And in the same sense, by what metric do we determine good enough for our lives? Is it where we are comfortable? Is it the place where we want to stay? Reuben Gad, half the tribe of Manasseh were like, you know, we'd like to stay here. You know? And, you know, but no, really, you know, what is good enough is to go back to the Creator and the purpose for which you were designed and created, and good enough is actually determined by God. That's, that's who determines our good enough. What's good enough? Well, who created us, you know? Who's, whose image is on us? You know, and for what purpose did he create us? And then when you go and you look in his, in his word about the way he describes, you know, that he uses these very heavy terms like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you know what, well, God, couldn't you just said 40%? or 70% or something, but, you know, and, and so I say all this to say that we see in the life of David great accomplishments, don't we? Early in his life. I'm telling you, he was, a, he was a spiritual superstar from early on, you know, and then he was a young boy, and he knew the Lord, and he had great experience in the Lord, great knowledge of the Lord, great, great you know, courage and all these things, and he slew uh, Goliath, and he was persecuted by Saul, and he ran, and he, he practiced so much faith, and he was such an effective leader, and he did all these things, and finally God brought him into the kingdom, and he returned the ark, and he had Israel and Judah together, and he was the king of, of all these things. And, and I, I suspect that at some point in time, that he arrived at a good enough mentality. But what David didn't realize, and, and I would very much think from my, my own self, that arriving there, you would assume that the spiritual rigor and experiences of your life are behind you. By this time, he's 40 to 50 years old. He has got some mission field stories, doesn't he? Man, sit down with David and have a cup of coffee. He'll tell you about all kinds of stuff, right? He'll tell you about hiding in caves, you know, from persecutors. He'll tell you about, you know, by faith I have leaped over a wall. Anybody got a story like that? By faith I have run through a troop, swords and spears slinging everywhere. And I mean, I don't think he was telling a lie. But somewhere, midlife for David... I, I am assuming, and I'm expecting because of experience with Bathsheba, with the turn of events in his life, with his own confessions given, you know, in Psalm 34 and Psalm 51, and, you know, the way he describes it, that he, he reached a point, perhaps maybe that he thought that 
high school, undergrad, grad school, and his honorary doctorates were behind him, spiritually. You know, and, and at this point in time, well, it's, you know, and is anybody here tempted to think the same way? I can recall many conversations over the years talking to people, and, and they talk about, you know, their sanctification as if it was something that happened back in the day. Oh, yeah, when I was, you know, a kid and I gave my life to Christ. And, and very truly, yeah, like there, there was a change and there was a transformation. And, and I'll, I'll tell you that, the, you know, I had a dramatic amount of sanctification in the first couple years of my life. But the, the, the error there, I think, so often is to assume that the process has stopped. And before you know it, you, you've already, you know, invited and infiltrated a good enough mentality, and you're no longer there wondering, how is the Lord shaping and conforming me today for tomorrow? Because every example I read in Scripture, God took people into their 80s and 90s and 110s and 120s, and if you want to go back to the pre-Diluvian era, era there, was, there was, you know, men in their 600s and 700s and 800s that were still being conformed into the likeness of Christ, that were still going through spiritual rigor. And, and I say all this because, you know, David's a, a faithful hero. He was described by God as a man after God's own heart. He, he has a, a wonderful resume, but I think David at this point had no idea the pain and suffering that was down the road in front of him. Not from some enemy on the battlefield trying to seek him down and to take his life. I mean, he, he knew what that was like. Not from some foreign army trying to, trying to catch him with an arrow on the battlefield and, and all those sorts of things. But, but David is coming into a whole new life experience at this age. I, and I'm, I'm just now learning. I feel very awkward this morning that I have to talk about something that I have so little experience in since I'm so young, you know. But... Uh, but I honestly, I mean, I, I, I joke, but I don't joke. I'm just now learning a, a new kind of pain and hardship in my life. And some of y'all know very well what I'm talking about, you know? Y'all understand very well that there's, there's something totally different, you know, to, to be expected. And so what I'm talking to y'all about this morning, spiritually, is the long walk the long walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, not the short walk. You know, now, you know, it's great to hear about the short walk and the season that you had in the early years of your sanctification. But I, you know, I want to think for myself and for each of you, you know, what do y'all envision and what are y'all, you know, determined to do and realizing the long walk. You know, there's a race in California every year called Badwater, Badwater 135. It, one time it was bad water 146 and it proved to be too much, but, but still very, very few people completed. It starts out in Death Valley, something like 280 feet below sea level, and it's like in July. So it's 120 degrees out there in the desert. They start out in Death Valley and they start running, right? And uh, what? y'all help me, what mountain is over there? It's, it's pretty close. It's only about 90 miles away. You know, but they, they've got to run through the desert and then they start ascending a mountain. And, and the end of the race is at like 8,500 feet elevation, 135 mile race. That's what they call an ultra marathon. And, and it's not it's not like, oh, you know, I made the marathon. Well, great. That's like the first fifth of the race. You know, well, I made it out of the desert. Well, you're halfway there. Now, now, well, you can deal with heat and you can deal with flatland running, right, for 70, 80 miles. But now, now you have to go into cooler temperatures and you have to go into higher elevations with less oxygen. And now you have to run uphill and you have to run downhill. Some of the runners can run uphill without a problem. Some of them can't run the downhills. 
as they're trying to go up this mountain range and they're doing this number and you know and some people do well here and some people die here and and such is with our christian life so often that we live through a season so well and we came into Jerusalem and we, we found our place in that God, that God had chosen for us. Like, you're the king now. And here you are. And David did so well in persecution and he did so well in affliction. And he, he found the place where God wanted him to be. And the place where he suffered and failed the most was in his prosperity. When he got to Jerusalem... And it was time for the kings to go out to war. And he stayed behind and he got distracted by a female. And, and then he chose to murder and he chose to do evil and he chose all these things. And, and what David needed to realize at that point was, wow, your sanctification is halfway through bad water, man. <laughs> like, you're halfway there. When I think so often we would like to think, you know, yeah, I'm sanctified in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm transformed, and, and you very well may be to some extent, but knowing from this point on what is ahead and what lies before you, and, and, I, and I say all this to warn you, because with bad water, I can tell you what the number one influential thing that causes people to quit is. You know what it is? Four-letter word, pain. Pain. Because it all, whether it's... The dehydration from the desert flats, whether it's your, you should see the feet of these people when they finish, you know, go, go look that up. Uh, you know, whether it's in their legs, well, no, you know, who knows what it may be that causes them to seize up. But, you know, you do a 135 mile race, you're going to experience pain. And pain is the thing that causes them to pull out. And I think so often life proves to be more painful in the latter half than the first half. And some of us want to think that that's, that's not right. Well, that's not right for a Christian person. We, you know, we shouldn't have to live in pain. You know, I, do you remember that the Lord himself, there's more painful emotion, emotion associated with the Lord in Scripture than there is you know, the happiness and joy. I hate to say that, but it's true. You go to Isaiah and you look what he was a man, right? Acquainted with grief and sorrow is the way it described him. And the range of emotions that he had to experience, you know, of, of grief, of abandonment, of agony, uh, of all these things. And, and so, listen, it, it is not wrong to have pain as a Christian, to have emotional pain. It's not wrong. In fact, it may very well be, be appointed unto you. To live through that, to experience that, to do all that. And, you know, that's exactly the thing that's, that Peter says, is that, you know, that he left us an example of suffering, that we ought to walk in his footsteps. And, and so I, I say this because I want to talk this morning about the long walk and our determination. You know, because when things get tough like this, this is tough. In fact, I, I can imagine that this was a different kind of pain altogether for David. That he didn't know. He didn't know anything about. And, you know, if you want to think that it's rare or unique, it's really not. I, I, can, I can think of celebrities, very godly people. I say celebrities. I mean like Billy Graham. You know, Franklin Graham was a rascal into his young adulthood. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but he was not a godly man in early adulthood and uh, you know the things that I, I remember Jennifer and I had two friends in the Lord uh, then I, I won't mention their names but the time that we were friends with them he was in his 80s she was in her late 70s they had served the Lord faithfully their entire life I mean these people were just as they oozed Jesus and just as godly as people as you can get, wonderful people, you know that they could not have children on their own. They adopted a daughter. That daughter became a manufacturer of methamphetamines. And she had two grandsons, which she taught to manufacture and sell methamphetamines. And that daughter eventually died, you know, from drug use. And not only that, but one of her sons, you know, a few years later, also overdosed on heroin. The other son, I have no idea where he is, what he's up to. The last time I talked to him, he was lured home by a, a group of men from a club and raped. 
because they told him they had some good drugs. And then, you know, man, that's painful. That hurts. That's my little tutti frutti. That's the little girl that I that I that I loved and that I nurtured and I changed her diapers and I and I cared for her. And, you know, when she was four, I held her hand through the zoo and I did all those things. Well, they they also adopted a son. These are godly people. You can't tell me otherwise. And this son in in early adulthood, uh, adulthood, after he had already had uh, children, decided that he was a homosexual. And he left his family and he abandoned his family to go live out his, his relationship with his boyfriend. I don't know if you could stab a parent in the heart deeper than to watch the lives of their child go to such an ungodly end. And so here David is, a man with so much experience, a man with with so much desire for God, said by God himself. And he comes into an age and tells me, listen, wake up, Jeffrey. You think you know something like (laughs) you're just 44 and your children are young. And I, I read this and we see what's going down here and we understand, we get the idea already. The horror, the terror, if this was your son and your son became infatuated and obsessed in lust with one of your daughters and he set up a plan to rape her and he raped her and and already, I'm telling you what, you would have a mom and a dad crying into the night and throughout the days and the weeks to come, you know, how did this happen and how did this come about and, and how did this take place and and it indeed it did and, and isn't it interesting that This is something old. This is something really old. Y'all remember the first family in Scripture? Adam and Eve. And in the image of, you know, God created man in the image of him. And, you know, in the image of God, God created them. You know, man and woman, he created he them. And then the next line, I think he said, and he said to them, you know, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it. And so here Adam and Eve, like, okay, you know, God created us. He, He said, you know, be fruitful, multiply, have kids. And so they had Cain, they had Abel. I guarantee you, they spent all the hours that parents today spend nourishing them and loving them. They're little tutti fruities, right? And, you know, probably had little pet names for them and, and adored them and loved them. And, and it did not take long in the history of man what happened. One of your children murdered your other child. I am just, in case you forgot, reminding us, warning us that this life and this world is filled with painful things. But you know, the the interesting thing was is so often, I don't know really how, but we just become numb to it. I can remember in the 90s when parents started going and getting birth control for their daughters that way they didn't have to worry about them getting pregnant and i I wonder like where where's the pain of the idea that your daughter is in the back seat of some truck with some boy throwing herself away as if she was worth nothing Where, where was that pain? Y'all know any parents like that? Maybe some people in this room, I'm not trying to come down on you, but, but I mean, that, that started to be a real thing in the 80s and 90s, wasn't it? Hey, let's get our kids on birth control. Make sure your son has condoms, right? You know? So we know, where's the pain? Where's the pain that should be in that? You know, then we went from trying to keep our kids off drugs to put, intentionally putting them on drugs. And, and I think if you want to ask me, I think pain has compounded and piled itself on top of us and on top of us for the last, you know, 30, 40 years that today, you know, nearly 50% of our entire population takes some kind of medication to deal. They'll say with all kinds of things, but I'll tell you what's beneath it is pain. Pain. 
the pain that's behind anxiety, the pain that's behind, of, that's behind depression, the pain that it's in, it's in life. And what do we do in our affluency? We try to wash it away with food and drink, and we try to wash it away with entertainment, and we try to wash it away with career and hobbies and purchasing and, and this and that and the other, and we have all these things to keep our minds so busy that we don't think of the reality Over 50% of our families are divorced. If that's you, please don't think I'm trying to pick on you. And if anything, I'm trying to say that you're very much, but I'm talking about pain. That there is pain in the brokenness of family bonds, and it has been from the beginning, and it still is, and it is a, the sign of an unhealthy culture. But David, for the, you know, for the first time of his life, as experienced as he was, is coming into this. And how in the world does, does he deal with this? And what in the world does he do? And Because we're faced with the same kind of, not the exact same story, but a lot of us have kids. And if you don't have kids, you're going to have kids someday. <laughs> and if there's, there's anything that God put on this earth that will break your heart, you know, if you thought it was that special someone that broke your heart and, and, and left you when you were, you know, uh, teenage, you know, honey bunnies, uh, you know, you might be in for a surprise that your kids might break your heart a little more. They might break your heart just a, a little bit more. But uh, I want to talk about the certainty of pain, I, and I wanted to talk about the question of our sensitivity to pain or the lack of it. You know, but here's the good questions about all these things. And, but I, I want to read along just a little bit more of what happened here. Then Amnon hated her with a very great hatred. He did not love her like what is a true and genuine love. He had a lust problem, right? He had a lust problem. And immediately after he partook and he realized that it did not fulfill his life, as he had convinced himself it would, he hated her. So that he hated her with, uh, with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up, go. Verse 16, but she said to him, no, my brother, for this, uh, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other than you did to me. But he would not listen to her. He called the young man. Uh, who served him and said, Put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So his servants uh, put her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that, that she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went. And her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived a, a desolate woman in her brother's Absalom's house. When King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. And after two full years, Absalom had sheep shears uh, at Baal uh, Hazor, which is near Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's son, and Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, your servant has shears. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome uh, to you. He pressed him, but he would not go, but gave him his blessing. And Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom pressed him until he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Then Absalom commanded his servants, Mark, when Absal with Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, Strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not fear. Have I, have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. While they were on their way, news came to David, Absalom has struck down all the king's sons, and not one of them is left. Then the king arose and tore his garments and lay on the earth, and all his servants who were standing by tore their garments. But Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, said, Let 
Not my lord suppose that they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon alone is dead. For by the command of Absalom this has been determined from the day he violated his sister Tamar. Now therefore let not my lord the king so take it to heart as to suppose that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon alone is dead, but Absalom fled. Can you put yourself in, in the position of that dad? I had a daughter who was raped by a son. And my other son killed that son. And now the son that killed the son that raped my daughter has fled, has run away. It's a little easier for us because we're Americans. I mean, we're hardly like together as a family anyway. But they, I mean, they were like, you know, they were so together in a, in a way. I mean, you can go to some other countries and get an idea how knit I was talking to someone before church started. They have a 90-something-year-old mother living with them. Because from their culture, you don't put your mother in a nursing home. I'm not trying to criticize us. I'm just saying they are so much more family bonded and oriented. They're like, no, we wouldn't do that. You, can't, you can hardly find nursing homes in India. You can't. It's hard. You know, uh, They're rather like orphaned elderly people because they don't have a family. And But the, the tightness of the family, and can you put yourself in the position of this dad and the pain that has entered into his life that he never knew before? He didn't have any experience with this. It's the first time for him. You know, and so stop and think about that. You know, and you know what? And he was where God wanted him to be. He was repentant. He was turned back unto God. We read Psalm 51. We read what the, the Lord said. The, you know, the Lord has removed your sin. And, and we know all these things. And yet God has permitted these things to take place in him. Now, you know, here's my questions to us. What will the outcome of each of these situations? What's the outcome of these situations in life? Because we have similar situations. I know some of you have Similar situations, painful situations. Children gone awry. Children that don't get along. Children that have gotten so close, yet really don't have a walk with the Lord. Maybe it's not children. Maybe it's siblings. Maybe it's your own parents. Maybe it's something like this, but the pain will be, you know, what are the outcomes of the situation? We don't necessarily know. But what are we to do? And here's another great question. What is the resulting narrative of your testimony? How, you know, what, what do you do and what do you choose to, how do you choose to act and how does that come out in the end? And, you know, in light of the situation that's happening now in your life, what will your testimony sound like in five years or ten years? You know, or, or something like that, I want to take us to finish, to, to just to close, and I know I'm probably going way over here. Uh, over here in, in Psalm, you know, Psalm chapter 3 is about this very thing. When uh, he fled Absalom, his son, after, because, you know, if y'all don't know the rest of the story, Absalom ends up being a, a sly politician, and he ends up attempting a coup over his dad with some success and you know and his dad chose to flee instead of kill his own son and 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 so psalm chapter 3 is all about that very thing but psalm chapter 4 is the one i want to read this morning and i think it's very near unto it very applicable you know in psalm chapter 4 verse 1 he said answer me when i call o god of my righteousness you have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. He remembers his past, right? And so he goes unto the Lord. And, you know, one thing that is certain, we can see it in this. Number one is suffering. He said about his past, you've given him relief. Right now, he's back in suffering. He needs relief. And then, in verse 2, we see that there's wonder. He said, O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long 
Will you love vain words and seek after lies? That's another horrible thing about the pain. About being in some kind of relational pain in this situation is that we don't have, at least bad water has a finish line. And you know, well, man, when I get up to that trailhead at 8,543 feet, whatever it is, you're like, well, then it's over. But we don't necessarily know in our walk with the Lord and the situations in which we go through, when, when is it over and when does this end? And it may not. We may go to our grave with that particular pain. That's why he says he wipes away every tear, you know. He wipes away every tear, and, and this is not it, right? This is not all of our life. But there was wonder there was there, that was there. And he said in, in verse 4, you know, be angry and do not sin. But the fact that there's anger there, there's anger. And I'll tell you, you know, if, if you're not experienced, so often you will find yourself teeter-tottering between receiving the pain or being angry and recalcitrant in it. And if you can get yourself mad enough at that loved one, well, then you're not hurt anymore. Sibling rivalry. Any of y'all have siblings that y'all just don't like each other so much and you don't really care if they go to hell or not? That's rough. <laughs> but what do you think that means? When, when you're immune to the pain of a loved one and the consequences and the actions of their life and, and their relationship with God, and you find out that anger, anger is there at the same time, and pride, and, and, you know, and you get tired of being hurt, and you get tired of living in the pain, but anger is there. But what did he say? He said, well, be angry, but don't sin. You know? But look, look at the verbs that are in this very same song. What are, if we go back to, to verse 2, he says, O man, how, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? He said, but no, but no, but no, that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, and the Lord hears when I call to him. I think that's one of the most important things as we walk through the pains of life is that very thing, but no. What do you know? Well, know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. And I'm telling you, if you think that's silly, no, that's not. That's something that you've got to have first and foremost, you know, fastened down, double strapped, ratcheted into your heart, into your mentality. I know God loves me. I know God loves me. God, you love me, right? God, can you imagine Adam and Eve? God, you said, be free. is this a trick, God? Was that a trick? Cain, Abel, and then you have one of them kill the other one, and you know, is that, you know, but no, no, know this. Know that God is loving, right? Know that he set the godly apart for himself, and the Lord hears when I call. And so what did he, he said, know that, and then what did he say next? Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the emotions of the situation drive you to sin, because you know that that is the objective of Satan in your life. That's the objective of the devil in your life, is to get you to act contrarily to God by manipulating the conditions of your life. And it says resist the devil. You know what God is trying to do? He's trying to keep you from seeking God. He's trying to keep you from praising God. He's trying to keep you from giving glory to God. He's trying to keep you from sharing God. You know, how do you resist the devil? Well, despite of all those things like Job, you praise God. You share God. You obey God. That's resisting the devil. The devil's trying to push you this way, and you're like, no, 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 no. Resist the devil, and he will flee far, far from you. He says what? He says, know this. He says, do not sin. Then he said, in the next line, he said, ponder your, in your hearts. Well, I like the, the other translations better. Meditate. Ponder sounds too flippant to me. Like, oh, you know, I think, you know meditate sounds more like I'm meditating right you know they wrote psalm 119 with the intention of it being memorized i think they meant meditate right <laughs> meditate in your own hearts on your bed so that you see the instructions that are given there by and this is a man with the experience the early experience the late experience he said no he said do not sin he said meditate in your own hearts and he said on your beds and be silent 
be still, be silent, listen to God, right? Be before him. He says, offer right sacrifices. Man, what do I do now? Do these things. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in God. He said, there are many who will say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. He says, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. Remember. You've got to go back and remember those mountaintop experiences with the Lord. I, I, would, I just recently read a book by David Goggins. That's where I pulled up Badwater from. And I'll warn you, if you read Goggins, he's not a Christian man. And blankety blank, you're going to know it. Uh, he's not a Christian man, but he's a very driven man. And I think I can learn something from him in that sense. And you know what he said? You know how I make it through the next ultra marathon? I, I remember the victory in the last ultra marathon. I was like, oh, you know, that's not too far away from our walk with the Lord. How do you get through this one? How do I live through this pain and this experience? I remember the victory. I re how did he get attack Goliath? I remember the victory over the bear. I remember the victory over the lion. And David continued that through his life. And he said, and I remember, you know, that you've given more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and their wine abound in their harvest day. You know, and then he determined Listen to this last verse. It's not like maybe he said, in peace I will. In peace I will, lie, uh, will both lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And that determination. And I, I just say all those things because I think so often most of the conversations I have, we, we drift through life. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm great. I'm good. Everybody's always great and good, you know. Meanwhile, in the in the private conference room in the back, families are falling apart. Children are going awry and astray. Husbands and wives are cheating on one another. You know, uh, elderly parents and middle-aged, you know, children relationships are falling apart. You know, and all around us, there is a screaming amount of pain and a totally like people are ignoring it. Or finding some way to deal with it. But you know, that, that's the prescription that God gives. And I, I'll say this, that I think God, I think that God expects 100%, you know, from us as He brings us through that experience that is probably going to feel like bad water to you. It's going to be a lot more than you wanted to feel, a lot longer than you wanted to feel it, you know. But it's doing something in you a lot more than you ever dreamed of doing. But the trust to remain in Him is the difficult thing. Let's pray. Father, God, I pray, Lord, that this is sensible and understandable, God, and I know it is the truth of Your Word, and and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take it from your word and write it upon our hearts and, and to give that application and that understanding, God, and lead us in the way everlasting. Cause us to know and to see and to understand. And Lord, make us to be those who serve you, Lord. To those who, those who are the faithful, God, and those who will take the long walk and finish well, as Paul said, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.